Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this event. Uh, we're very excited today to have uh, Dr. Thea Tilia Kanan from the Director of the European Center for Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Um, and also we have Brett Schaefer, who is with us here at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. Um, my name is Laura Thornton. I'm the Director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy, and we welcome you here today for this somewhat informal conversation and that we hope you will all participate in as well. Uh, to, that, to that event, um, you can use your chat function and when we get to the question and answers, I'll be able to look at your questions and then we can have a discussion around that. So we do encourage you please to participate. Uh, but before we get started, um, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the Center of Excellence. I have had some interaction with your organization, and it's, it's truly impressive. Um, you know, bringing more than 1,000 practitioners and experts from across different states and institutions, and really looking at a sort of whole-of-society approach to hybrid threats, and being really innovative and action-focused. So I've always been very impressed, and it really is similar, uh, maybe on a much smaller scale for the Alliance, but similar to our mission in terms of taking a holistic view of the threatened environment and trying to figure out ways to de deter and defend against. So maybe before we get into questions, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your work in the center. Uh, so the center was established 2017, so it's pretty young. Uh, it was in the immediate aftermath of the Ukraine crisis when these uh, hybrid threat instruments started to seriously pop up in, in the transatlantic security environment. Uh, we saw the forms of hybrid warfare with the green men. Uh, it's a reminder of that. Uh, we were very much talking about new technologies, what kinds of instruments they will provide for hybrid threat actors. The whole disinformation, information manipulation being popped up. Uh, so, in the governments, uh, in the transatlantic realm, people started to talk about the need to, to build capacity to counter this phenomenon. Uh, and uh, an autonomous actor such as the center uh, uh, is, uh, is a good platform to bring together uh, practitioners, but also academic experts uh, to this uh, joint endeavor uh, to build capacity, uh, make proposals to, to governments how to counter. Uh, we have best practices in, in many countries that we want to, to share. Uh, in, in the transatlantic context. So, uh, a lot of demand, uh, a lot of need, the field is huge. We need, we need to share our experience and our, our uh, uh, conclusions. So, the center has been growing fast. We have currently 30 participating states, and we work very closely with the UN NATO. And one of the, the goals of the center is to uh, facilitate cooperation between the two of them, EU and NATO, when it comes to countering uh, So uh, I'm very happy to uh, to be the director of the of the center, and the Helsinki office has has also been growing. We have some forty experts uh, from uh, from from our different participating states with very different backgrounds, um, and as said, uh, a network based organization. So it's not only us in the at the office, but we, we work with the governments, with practitioners, practitioners in this work. So, yeah, very, very eager to take this work forward. There are certain challenges that we have to face. Indeed. Um, you know, it's, I think, you know, there's been ample uh, diagnosed, diagnostics of the problem that we face, and, and we're very concerned at the Alliance, as you all are, about how you know, autocratic threats can really undermine our democracies, um, so distrust in our institutions and how damaging this is on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I'm really interested in, you know, solutions. Uh, and there's a lot of European experience about building the defenses, whether it's working on preventative measures or interagency cooperation or EU tech regulations. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what is working. You know, what are some of the best practices that you're seeing from, from Europe? Uh, I think uh, we talk about uh, two, two things. So we talk about resilience. 
how do we make our our societies more resilient uh, uh, when it comes to to hybrid threats, unconventional threats that we are not used to? We don't have the right instruments or policies. We don't have the preparedness to to meet them. So, how, how, what what do these threats in, uh, require of our societies in terms of resilience? That's a big discussion. That's where we try to identify proper means uh, that might uh, mean different things when it comes to uh, a resilient information space, a healthy media environment. Uh, when we talk about legal resilience, uh, that's a different thing. So it's a kind of we, we need a comprehensive approach. We need to bring the actors together, not only the government but but also. Uh, in the society, the private actors, civil society actors, because this is uh, our whole societies are being targeted. So we need a, a whole of society approach. So resilience and the different instruments there. So what we do is 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 also that we pick up good practices from uh, from the states that those states have, that have had some success <laughs> uh, uh, with 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 their policies. Uh, I come from Finland, so so of course we know the the comprehensive security approach from our small Scandinavian countries, uh, vast territories, small populations, and the very demanding geopolitical environment. So we have had to to engage uh, the whole society and to, to see uh, the security uh, challenges as, as a comprehensive uh, thing. So we talk about comprehensive security. It's not only about about uh, Part for military defense, we need other instruments. So this is this is the discussion that we are having about participating states. What 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 are these instruments? How do we put up them? Uh, EU and NATO, of course, uh, provide uh, good forum for cooperation. The EU also has a uh, has a number of legislative instruments. It's it's uh, it can support its, its member states. The uh, NATO is a little bit different. Uh, after but, but still has a, a, a potential also to counter counter my habits and, and build resilience. So resilience is one topic and then perhaps we, we get later on to the other that is more proactive when we talk about how to deter mm -hmm. how to deter these threats. So so the toolboxes are there, we need to uh, we need to take them into active use and, and we need to think about how to uh, apply them, how to adjust them to this environment of threats with the traditional ones. Absolutely, and I do want to come back in particular to, um, you know, some successes in Finland. But before that, I'm going to turn quickly to um, my colleague Brett uh, to describe a little bit what we're seeing on the information operations side. Um, ASD just completed a project with GMF that looks at the German election environment. And, um, you know, we looked at external actors, but we also looked at the domestic media. We, looked, we did audience analysis. You know, Brett, what, what did we see here? What are sort of some of the lessons learned from this uh, project? Yeah, so I'm gonna try to get my screen to actually share full screen here, but it's being blocked a little bit by the toolbar at the bottom. If I can't get it, I'll just get all along. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about our findings, uh, looking at the German election, looking at state-backed actors in the German election, and then putting it in the context of what we're seeing more broadly, monitoring Russian state-backed activity, as well as Chinese and Iran state-backed activity across many social media platforms. And then finally, kind of talk a little bit about the potential solutions and the challenges with those solutions. So... One of the main findings when we looked at the German media landscape around the election that was sort of shocking is that RT Deutsch is a significant player in the German language space. On Facebook over the last year, they outperformed every other German language media outlet in the world. So this is not just other state-backed media outlets, foreign state-backed media outlets, domestic media outlets. So Bill, Der Spiegel, if you look at total interactions, they outperform them. If you looked at the RT Deutsch Twitter account, it was one of the top five Twitter accounts that we looked at in the German language space. If you looked at YouTube, they were a top five player on YouTube as well. So they had a significant audience within Germany. 
But then when we looked at the content and what was attracting audiences to RT Deutsch, one of the main findings there was that most of their content had very little to do with Russia, which is fairly typical when you monitor Russian state-backed media outlets, but had very little to do with politics or geopolitics. Where they were finding an audience was with coronavirus skepticism around vaccines, uh, around public health mandates, masking, for example. So the top five tweets when we looked at any tweet mentioning vaccine, all of them were skeptical of vaccines. So they talk about uh, Pfizer uh, having these sort of um, financial motivations. It, they shouldn't be trusted. Uh, they amplify every instance where there was an adverse reaction to the vaccine, especially deaths. So we just saw this sort of tsunami of misleading information around the safety of public health measures. This was even more prominent when we looked at YouTube. On YouTube, nine of their top 10 most viewed videos promoted vaccine skepticism, or again, skepticism towards other public health measures. So saying it's vaccines are part of a huge global experiment. We made a big mistake with the vaccine. Uh, that this is a world experiment on children. So it is just this sort of constant trickle of malinformation, uh, creating skepticism among the public. And then when we looked at the groups on Facebook that were sharing the most RT Deutsch content, it was pretty apparent where this was finding a home. I think in about 20% of the top 100 groups, their sort of mission overtly uh, was to resist public health measures, particularly vaccines. When you actually dug a little bit deeper, probably 70, 80% had part of their core mission of resistance to public health measures. So at the top there, you see resist, resistance against uh, coronavirus madness, I mistrust the government, uh, vaccines, no thank you. This was the sort of constant theme. So once they attracted audiences with this sort of coronavirus or skepticism to coronavirus mandates, of course, then they become in the RT full. So other geopolitical content just shows up in their feed. RT Deutsch was, uh, it, this was particularly apparent on RT Deutsch, but they are not an exception when you look globally at the success of Russian state media outlets on social media. It's hard to see in the room here, but I hope people watching can see this. This is looking at Latin America, so Spanish language outlets. This is not a comprehensive list, but RT and Espanol sits third between BBC and Univision. Significantly outperforms Deutsche Welle in Spanish, AG Espanol, uh, Voice of America. It has about 10 times the audience and in interactions over the last year. And then when you look at the entire landscape of Russian media outlets on Facebook, so Russian media pages, one of the things that I think is telling is, yes, RT sits about fourth, so their flagship English language outlet does pretty well. But most of their other top performers are not English language outlets. So RT Deutsch is there at fifth. RT in Espanol is three. RT Arabic blows everything out of the water. But when you zoom down a little bit more, you're seeing Sputnik, uh, Sputnik Greek outlet, their Turkish outlet, their French outlet, their Czech outlet. So RT America and RT UK, where we spend a lot of attention uh, monitoring, looking at it, coming up with ways to uh, inoculate the public against RT in a sort of English language parts of the world, they're sitting at 19th and 21st, respectively. So we're spending, I think, too few resources monitoring non-English language spaces. And then finally, just to kind of quickly wrap this up, I think one of the mistakes we often make is Everything we've, we've focused on so far looks a little bit at just the demand side of, I mean, I think we should spend a lot of attention looking at the demand side, but these are people that are attracted to RT Deutsch, who know, or to RT's outlets, who know that they are going to a Russian state media outlet. This is overt. Uh, there's no real obfuscation here. But what happens on search engines, so when people run just sort of generic queries, is because RT has this sort of massive footprint around the world and they flood social media channels. They post more often. Uh, they post consistently on multiple platforms. They have footprints on Telegram. All of these spaces where traditional media outlets just have far less visibility, they tend to dominate search engine results. So this, the, the result of this is people who are not sort of naturally attracted to RT, would never go to RT's site, but would search for a geopolitical, political topic 
they're being pushed to Russian state-backed content. So this is a search a couple of years ago uh, that I ran for Nord Stream 2. Two of the top three results that we got back were both from Russian state media outlets. This is consistent when you search for Nord Stream 2. Then on YouTube, I searched for Skripal. This was actually when I was in the UK. Two of the top three results are from Russian state outlets. I think eight of the top 10 were from Russian state media outlets. But it's not just the Russians who do very well at exploiting these data voids on search engines. When we search for Fort Detrick, which of course is this sort of Chinese conspiracy theory about the origin of coronavirus, basically all of the top results come from Chinese state media outlets. So state back outlets are particularly effective because they have this massive footprint globally at filling data voids on search engines. So the result is when people just innocently go to a search engine, want to learn more about a topic, they are being directed towards state media outlets. But this is also, also exists outside of the world of state media or other sort of problematic actors who have a huge interest in a particular topic, can carpet bomb that topic with a bunch of different posts and content, and then they essentially own that space on search channels. So I'll just wrap up there because I've gone on for a bit too long here and want to get back to a bit more of the conversation. No, oh, thank you so much, Brett. Um, it's interesting because given what you're talking about in terms of the language ecosystem, it seems, I, as my understanding is that social media company enforcement is taking down content that violates terms of service is, is worse in other language ecosystems. Um, where else could this be, you know, an issue? Well, I mean, I think across the board, they spend far less resources monitoring non-English language channels, mm -hmm. particularly in countries where there is less political pressure on Google and Facebook and Twitter to clean up their act. Because there is a ton of media attention here, there's a ton of civil society attention on mis and disinformation. They are investing, uh, at least in theory, and trying to clean up those spaces. But where you get to under-resourced countries that are probably more vulnerable to begin with because they have a less robust independent media environment, they are spending less resources on media literacy or on content moderation. So you have this real sort of flipped priorities where they're spending more money in countries that are major sort of economic political players that already are fairly well resourced because they have robust media environments, civil society, and the countries that are already more vulnerable are getting less resources pushed towards them from the companies. Right. Or even a lack of presence, like right. Myanmar. Myanmar is sort of Facebook people being based in Singapore or, right, yeah. Absolutely. What we have found, at least anecdotally, is in countries where they have a physical presence, it's sort of it's, it's logical, they invest more money in civil society organizations there, fact-checking and media, when they don't have a presence, they don't invest as much right, there. Yeah. So that, that leads me to sort of the issue also of smaller member states. I mean, where, where do you see the role of smaller member states in fending off some of these information attacks? Uh, well, I wanted to get back to that phenomenon because when listening to you, uh, it's, it, it's very obvious for us that this is a huge tool uh, that the uh, malign actors have at their disposal. How they are going to use this tool uh, then might depend, depend on, on the needs and on the circumstances. Uh, we have, uh, so, so I think uh, there is all the reason to pay attention to social media platforms and possibilities to, 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 to regulate them without compromising our values, of course. Uh, but but the, the media environment is, is, is such a challenge uh, from the point of view of our uh, systemic rivalry between democracies and, and the authoritarian systems. It provides such a tool and, and resource uh, for, for the actors that, that want to challenge our, our democracy. Well, uh, uh, smaller states, I, I think, uh, not only smaller states, but, but all of us have to pay attention to I mentioned the healthy uh, information environment. What does that mean? Uh, what does uh, what does that mean? What does that require? Uh, we have to. Well, it's uh, it has been pointed out many times that there are now different rules for social media platforms and journalistic media. Mm -hmm. Journalistic media being much uh, much more regulated. There are certain standards and, and ethics uh, for 
uh, for, for journalism, uh, whereas there is a, a kind of wild west uh, men mentality prevailing in, in, in social media. So, so we have to, uh, I think it's now, uh, it's, it's the right time to, to, th to think about how to safeguard a diverse but healthy media environment. Uh, a lot of talk in smaller states in the European Union about the media literacy mm -hmm. of our future generations. Uh, about uh, the necessity to, to, to protect financially uh, journalistic media, uh, to make, uh, well, raise public awareness about, about the phenomenon of disinformation. So uh, I think in, in small or, or large uh, states, uh, this is the topic that we should address uh, now before uh, the malign actors start using still more seriously these, these instruments that you, you pointed out they might have at their disposal uh, via, via, via social media channels. It's, um, you know, I want to get to the sort of citizen side of things in a moment, but, um, you know, one thing that we've seen in terms of not just external actors, but of course internal actors in terms of the information space is there's a very, very gendered component particularly for women in politics and women in public life, where, um, you know, they are disproportionately targeted with uh, negative uh, information or even misrepresentation of their personal lives, etc. I was wondering if at the center you had looked into this issue of how, um, you know, sort of autocratic threats can disproportionately uh, target specific communities, uh, marginalized communities, be they women or uh, LGBTQ community or or immigrant communities, et cetera. I mean, are you are you looking specifically at, at sort of the community breakdown of some of these threats? Uh, well, as 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 we as a hybrid center cover the the whole range of hybrid threats, we we haven't uh, gone that much into detail when it comes to following. Uh, information operations. There is also another uh, COE focusing on that. But of course, uh, as, a, as an instrument that can be used to polarize societies, polarize public discourse, uh, so mistrust uh, within societies. Uh, and, and, and we very much, from the hybrid threat point of view, see this instrument as one of those instruments that being, is, is, is used in concert together with other instruments. So we have also to ask ourselves. Uh, uh, what is the operation that is going on where this information uh, operation is, is, is a part? So what's the more, more overall goal of that operation? What, what does it uh, uh, deal with? Uh, so, so we see cyber operations where, is, where there is an information operation component. We see so many, many types of hybrid threat operations where the manipulation of information uh, space forms a part. Uh, so, so we, we haven't uh, gone that much into to detail uh, when it comes to to, to uh, different societal parts of minorities. But but, but, but the polarization, as uh, when I was listen, listening to you, uh, and, and and the COVID how COVID was used, but well, this is uh, this is a typical way of an external actor to to so so distrust and and polarize public opinion. We can also talk about about leadership of, of public discourse. Who has the leadership in, in our, our social media realm? Uh, and uh, I think that this, there are clear, clear risks also on the basis of your, your, your uh, monitoring or mapping of the social media. I think that's, that's right. I mean, I I think the objective, of course, is you know, we, we saw sort of uh, heightened attention to the leading female candidate, but also we've seen how uh, information operations are looking at sort of domestic American issues related to gender or to sexual orientation. Yeah, I mean, in particular, recently around uh, LGBT issues, but especially transgender athletes 
that was a big focus over the summer. The Olympics provided a kind of rallying point for that with, I think, the New Zealand weightlifter, who was the first transgender athlete to participate. But we see that really being used way more as a, as a domestic wedge issue. Mm -hmm. We know these fights are happening in local school boards over whether or not trans athletes can participate in high school sports. This is not something that Russia cares about, right. obviously, as a geopolitical issue, but it gives them an audience for their content. It, it aligns them with a certain subset of Americans, people globally. And again, it's, it's sort of a insinuation and then influence on other issues as well. Part of it is, yes, let's just keep throwing uh, lighter fluid on the fire to sort of fan the flames. Um, but frankly, they don't need to help Americans right now be divided. So I think it's really, it's more effective, as you said, burrowing into these conversations, like throwing red meat to the audience to attract them. And then once you start following this outlet, you get their entire worldview. So the audience who wouldn't care about Ukraine or Syria, but they're attracted to RT because of the anti-vax content or the anti-LGBT content, they're in that world. And so they see everything start popping up in their feed and it just, you know, it, it's sort of this subtle manipulation. It's, it's interesting too, because as you both have mentioned, um, you know, for example, the COVID uh, information uh, operations, in addition to sort of sowing doubt about Pfizer or whatnot and the origins of COVID being in Fort Detrick or, 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 or that, there's also a, a sort of subtext message about democracies. And you mentioned sort of this, you know, the, that global competition between autocracy and democracy. And we see that, you know, more and more citizens on both sides of the Atlantic are, you know, moving away from liberal democratic values. They're, they're choosing autocrats through the ballot. They're um, attracted to this alternative vision. And so I want to get back to the resilience building. And, you know, what are some things that you think specifically have worked on that you know, demand side to build that citizenry that's more discerning, but also that, that believes in the democratic experience. Um, well, uh, it, it, there needs to be several levels uh, in this discussion. So basically, uh, our main message is uh, first that we need to stick to our values. We need to safeguard our rule of law society. We need, need to uh, stick to our values of, of human rights, uh, democracy, democratic practices. However, uh, or irrespective of how firmly uh, they are being challenged, we don't, we, we should not start compromising about mm -hmm. our values. This is what the adversaries want. This is what they want to achieve. Uh, we can trust uh, first, but also uh, want to make us uh, Start, we should start making compromises about our values. And this, this, this leads to a, a, a wrong direction, simply. So uh, we are challenged. I, I think we are also, uh, uh, they are play, playing the upper hand for the time being. If we look at COVID, how, how the democratic model was, was is predicted, mm -hmm. how, how inefficient is, is, uh, they wanted to be. Uh, to, to be or, or markets, how they wanted to, to make the democratic order to be seen inefficient uh, uh, and, and uh, slow, slow, slow messy, lack of trust yeah. and, and, and all of that. So, so we, we should stand up, we should defend not only the model but also the, the, the democratic practices, which also had, uh, of course, uh, experienced difficulties during the COVID times. The parliaments could not convene, the, the political groupings, could, there were no political campaigns prior to elections and all of that necessary uh, civil society activity that is part of a vital democracy. Uh, so all, all of those suffered due to COVID. Uh, so so uh, res a resilient uh, society is a society that, uh, that safeguards uh, and relies on, on the democratic values, rule of law, human rights, democratic practices. Let's start with that, mm -hmm. because if, uh, when we when we look at also hybrid activity, 
and, and the target countries. So, of course, the most vulnerable targets are, uh, are countries that uh, do not have the democratic practices in, in place that, uh, that have difficulties with them. Um, then the other level of discussion deals with the model. And, and, and there is, a, as, as, as I said, the, the, the challenges, challengers are, are stronger. So uh, they are spreading their model. They have, uh, well, we, we believed for a long time that uh, a system such as the Chinese one uh, could not be possible. The communist rule uh, uh, together with a, a, a type of, uh, of market economy. That's the, the strengthening of the market economy will, will step by step lead to uh, to the uh, middle class uh, starting to, to demand also political rights, and that would lead to a them to a democratic path. But we see that 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 that, that didn't happen, and, uh, and and the model Chinese model, the authoritarian model, is is uh, is, is gaining ground uh, globally. Uh, also, of course. Uh, uh, there's a lot of ch Chinese mon uh, money and funding behind that all over the, all the world. Uh, so, so uh, resilience means uh, that, that we, we have to safeguard our values and that we have also at the global level, we have to, to, to fight for, for our democratic model. And we have to take the leadership when you, you showed who uh, uh, leads the narrative. So we have, have to take back the yeah. leadership of, of global discourse and, and take our own or take our narrative in our own hands more strongly. Now the, the adversaries are leading this this competition. This is this is such an interesting point because I agree. You know, when I was living in Georgia, the country, it, 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 there was so much playing defense, right, as opposed to playing offense, right. And we did this interesting experiment on national narrative where instead of waiting for you know both Kremlin and domestic disinformation that was about trying to turn Georgia away from EU and NATO and, and um, sort of this weird nationalism that it was promoting to try to make the narrative about what being Georgian really means, you know, and, and it's about tolerance, it's about diversity, it's, and, and actually some of that was, was really useful in, in, in changing sort of opinion. So getting out in front of it with the offensive tactic, I think is, is extremely interesting. Um, you know, another uh, thing that we hear often about in terms of uh, resilience is related to civic education, related to media literacy. I was wondering if maybe you had, I know Finland, for example, has, has done some work even with young children, as I understand. Could you speak a little to that program and its effectiveness? Well, it has to start at schools. It has to start with, with, with young children. Uh, media literacy has been built up uh, at, uh, in our, our school education. Uh, of course, uh, how it is being done depends on, on the age of the pupils, but, but, but at an early age, we, we should we should start uh, educating uh, young people about the current media environment and and uh, and how does uh, how what does uh, resilience resiliency mean mean in that context? How do we uh, compare compare sources? Uh, how do the different media channels differ? Uh, and and uh, and of course uh, uh, to try to to build up a diverse uh, media environment. But I think media literacy. I I. I um, yeah, start early, uh, build up a comprehensive uh, education program at schools, uh, and of course then we have to teach the teachers as, as well mm. at the university uh, level. Uh, but also I, I, I think uh, media literacy together with the, with the diverse media environment, and, and I can only stress the need of of, of quality journalism yeah. because I, I think it's, uh, the balance is now, now not, not, it's, it's very uh, in, incorrect balance between the social media channels uh, uh, taking the priority and, and uh, young people are, are, are getting their, their information mainly from, the, from that source. Uh, so so it's in, in the long run this is a problem for, for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, even if you did, it, I mean, it has to be 
a holistic approach because even if you do focus on children and, and, and making them more discerning about their sources, we also have just heard very troubling um, disclosures about Facebook and Instagram and the damage they've had on, on young girls, for example. Um, so it is, it is something to be mindful of. You know, one of the, one of the sort of interesting points of conversation is you mentioned a little bit is about the need to sort of stick together. Um, I know the, I mean, we know the Biden administration is going to have a summit for democracy. I mean, what are ways that, what's your vision for what we can be doing more collectively, uh, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic or even globally, you know, are there good formats for, to facilitate this kind of learning and to share some of the best practices? Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, if we talk about the, the information environment, uh, well, uh, one thing that we, we can start with is, is to pay attention to the, to the private actors and to engage public-private cooperation in, in this realm throughout uh, uh, our, our transatlantic community. Uh, I think uh, we, have, we have started with that, but there is a lot more to be done. If we, if we talk about, uh, as, as I said earlier, uh, from the hybrid uh, center's point of view, the, the use of this information, uh, manipulation is, is, is a part of a broader hybrid campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, of course, uh, we, we need to uh, cooperate. Uh, there are many challenges. Uh, the cyberspace, for instance, is, is one. Uh, another uh, field or, or uh, domain that provides uh, uh, possibilities, huge possibilities for, for adversarial activity, and we, we know how dependent we are. And that is also related, of course, to the information space, the whole field of cyber. But also in, the, in our center, we look at uh, critical infrastructures more in general, very broadly, all from sea lines of communication to our, uh, to our energy resources, to our financial mm -hmm. systems. And, and even a little bit to, to, towards the space, uh, where there are also critical infrastructures. And uh, so we, we want to uh, analyze those vulnerabilities. Uh, so, so from the broad, from the point of view of this broad landscape of hybrid threats mm -hmm. and our vulnerabilities, uh, the solution can only be uh, cooperation amongst uh, us democratic uh, states uh, in the EU context, NATO context, transatlantic cooperation. Uh, we need to, to find common solutions. We need to. We cannot be uh, efficient in, in, in deterring uh, the adversaries if we don't, do not work together. So we are stronger if we if we can send a, a, a common message uh, and find also the common tools. Uh, and, and we can talk a little bit about about how to deter uh, malign activity. It's a, it's a challenge, but but also their cooperation is the key. If we go uh, state by state, that we we uh, weaken ourselves and uh, and, uh, and and it's easy for the adversaries to to show this unity or or uh, we we see on a daily basis how easy easy that that is. So so unity and cooperation is here. Yeah, I mean, and we just saw sort of looking at the broader sort of threat toolbox. Uh, for example, this recent Pandora uh, papers, we see how it requires all states to cooperate on how to, you know, regulate the enablers of such malign finance that's, that's, that crosses borders. So it can't be a single state um, solution. But also, I think your point about setting the broader narrative of the importance of sort of the global narrative of democratic governance and how, you know, we need to be challenged, challenging that together and um, having a sort of coordinated approach. Right. Also, sort of the same question to you. I mean, where do you see sort of global learning on this? Like, what can the German elections teach us or prepare us to give us a heads up for the French elections or the midterms? <laughs> well, I think one of the main takeaways that I don't know how exactly translatable it is to other political contexts so that as much as we showed how effective RT Deutsch was at cultivating an audience, the information space in Germany, by and large, around the election, I think was pretty healthy. I mean, we didn't see significant attacks 
uh, going after this sort of uh, the, the security of the election, uh, challenging the results itself. And that goes to the political leadership in Germany, didn't the AFD a little bit, but by and large didn't fan those flames. And so when you look, <laughs> you compare that to 2020 in the US, where of course it was domestic political leadership that were the ones on the front lines questioning whether the results were valid, that just sort of gives a, a pretty wide opening for other manipulators to seize on those narratives. So I think the main takeaway from Germany is that it requires political leadership to be responsible, but I don't know exactly how you can <laughs> go to the French and others and say, you need to be more yeah, responsible yeah, yeah, yeah. and not take advantage of these things. So the lesson learned in Germany, I'm not sure, yeah, can translate necessarily, but in terms of how we can learn from one another and getting to sort of a common understanding of how we, we tackle some of these issues, there's obviously different levels of comfort between the U.S. and Europe about content moderation, content regulation in particular. Europeans, I think, generally are more comfortable with things that sort of exist in the world of hate speech just being taken down, where it makes Americans a little bit queasy when you start talking about censorship. And actually, some of the efforts by the platforms to take content down have become talking points for the RTs right. of the world. So... I think the companies need a little bit more of an international understanding of what they should be doing. Not that they are not uh, responsible for policing their own platforms, but in some ways, oftentimes they're a bit damned if they do, damned if they don't. Because again, political leadership on certain sides are taking advantage of what they're doing to say that this is censorship against a certain political position. And so I think getting to a point where we have some direction we can give to the companies of this is what we want the internet to look like. And right now, I don't think there's a common understanding there. And when we talk about deterrence too, yes, the, the platforms need to do more, but also, I mean, there are other mechanisms that can be used, sanctions and others. So what is the sort of government response to it across the democratic space? And I don't think that's very clear either. And also your point about um, incentives. So if political actors don't see a benefit or do see a benefit, then it's really difficult. I mean, I think there have been some interesting um, experiments that are not enforceable, of course, but like the, the Dutch political parties had a code of conduct ahead of the election to you know, make a pledge not to uh, you know, share and, and, and peddle in disinformation and and I'm not sure how effective that was, but it was something at least citizens could hold them to account for. So that if they saw a political candidate sharing uh, RT Deutsch clip, yeah. you know, at least they could hold them to account. There's, actually, there's, there's a perverse incentive right now to be polarizing because you then are the account that is going to show up in people's feed because you're getting more interactions. You just know if you're more controversial, yes. you get more engagement and you get on more people's radar, and you're the people that CNN and Fox call to do quick hits about the political. So most of, again, looking at the US landscape, the politicians who are diplomatic, bipartisan, they don't really exist on social media. Who you see in your feeds are, are the most combative, bombastic, polarizing figures. And that then becomes, I think, what people's perception of Washington becomes, and other politicians see that. <laughs> well, if I have a chance in this primary, I, get I need to start yeah. throwing bombs. And you see that, you know, with the Chinese wolf warriors, that most retweeted, liked Chinese diplomats are the ones who have taken the most aggressive tone. The ones who are still diplomatic might as well not, not exist. exist. They have a thousand followers. And so this whole incentive structure also exists at the I mean, when you look at who the platforms are giving a, a bigger sort of platform to, and then also in the political space where money is flowing into, mm -hmm. who the traditional media go to for quotes, right now we're rewarding those who are, I would say, the most problematic in terms of the content they share and the, the sort of tone of their political discourse. Yeah. Um, well, we don't have much time, and we do have actually quite a few questions. So, um, 
How this one seems directed mostly at you. Uh, to what extent do you look at investment screening and other financial elements in your assessment of hybrid threats? I think this is uh, this is an excellent question. We have to uh, so we uh, we pay attention to the benefit of uh, uh, foreign direct investment, in, for instance, uh, from China in critical infrastructures. Uh, rather than uh, have a look at, at, at the, the for, forms of funding, we try to figure out, uh, we work at the strategic level, try to figure out what the strategy is. What is interest? Where, what does China want to buy and, and, and why? What's the future purpose of, of that? And then, of course, uh, when it comes to our, our willingness to counter hybrid threats, how might it play out uh, in a later context? So what should happen? What, what does it require from us? Of course, dependency here is, is the word. Mm. Uh, but uh, malign funding in, in different different ways from state actors, they brought there in this context uh, uh, criminal activity. These, these are all parts of this phenomenon of public threats. So, yes, this, this is interesting for us, but we, uh, we are pretty much at the strategic level trying to find out uh, what, what the goal of this activity is. Mm. It, it might function long term. If, if we see a pattern, if we see a strategy, we see China, of course, uh, in Africa, Central Asia, Latin America, in the Arctic, and, and, and the interests are a little bit, and the behavior is, is, is the same. Interest to walk towards uh, ownership of critical infrastructures, uh, also creating political partnerships, uh, without specific conditions, political conditions. So, yes. Yeah, and what tools are at our disposal? Uh, when, we, when, we, when we're countering these, or defending yeah, against. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, we, have to, we have to be aware of our vulnerabilities as societies. We have to assess uh, the dependencies that, that are being created when we, uh, when we are selling or allowing, uh, well, it's, 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 it's private, so, so how do we regulate that? Uh, but, but of course, the public forms of critical infrastructure, that is more, more in the hands of the governments, so and they have to be careful when, uh, when foreign investors, uh, public or private, <laughs> if they are from, from, from some particular countries, show interest towards, towards the resources. And where allies are even, that's why global cooperation is even more important. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, to help with diversification and, you know, yes. Particularly in the global south, I mean, not just in the global south, but yeah. in the global yeah. yeah. Um, so here's, there's so many questions. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, did Finland experience any resistance in implementing the media literacy curriculum for children? I haven't seen any critical uh, discussion, any 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 resistance uh, on, on that. I think uh, uh, we have been uh, living uh, in in our neighborhood <laughs> uh, with a uh, with a difficult uh, at times very difficult uh, relationship with our our big eastern neighbor of Russia. Uh, so we have been used to uh, facing also information campaigns. Uh, so that is, uh, media literacy has, has for a long time been a part of our comprehensive security model. Uh, so I think uh, there, is, there is broad understanding about the necessity of that, that element and that form of uh, resilience in our society. So it's, it's well understood. I wonder if it would be the same here. <laughs> no, it's easy answer. Yeah. Um, no, but that's, that's encouraging to hear. Um, here's another question. Uh, I think for either of you, there was a similar agreement to counter disinformation and warn each other of suspicious activity in the context of the German elections as well. And as far as I can see, it was pretty effective in providing for a boring election season. Or am I off target? I'm assuming the question is about between political parties in Germany. I guess, yeah. There's a similar agreement to counter just, yeah, 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 yeah. 
uh, I'm, I, each I, other suspicious activity. I wasn't particularly aware of that agreement, so I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. I think it probably goes more to they have to work together after the election to build coalitions. So it's not a sort of zero sum game that is in the U.S. Of, in a two party system where like you know the party who wins and the party who loses, and that's it's sort of a blood sport. Like after the election results, they have to come together and form functioning government. So I think that leads to a little bit less of the just sort of hyper-partisan nature of the, the discourse that we see here. I, again, I don't know. I, I don't think that would work in the U.S. right now. Mm -hmm. It would. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's absolutely no way. There's, there's the level of trust is so low between the parties and the political leaders. Um, I, I, I just can't imagine that functioning. In the U.S. Yeah, I, for sure, I agree with you on that. Um, so here's another question. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this idea of deterrence? Uh, how do you deter information threats? Can you share examples of successful policies or measures? Mm -hmm. So uh, we could start by, by asking ourselves what does uh, <laughs> what does it mean? And, uh, a very simple definition is that uh, uh, it is a cost that we are putting on uh, malign activity, uh, so the so that the adversaries know. Uh, and of course, we in order that in, in order to 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 enable them to know, we should communicate that our willingness to put a cost. So when they assess whether they should do something or not, they know that that there might be a cost to put on, on, mm -hmm. on them. So they can assess whether it's it's worth it. And of course, a, a successful deterrence is such when the adversary decides not to to do that activity because the cost mm -hmm. is too high. And, and uh, if we can achieve that, then we are successful. But it is, of course, in, in real life, it's not that easy. But uh, but our recommendations are are such that in uh, so deterrence comes from a, a different context. A nuclear deterrence uh, during the Cold War era was mostly the primary context. Now we talk about very different different environment, very different forms of activity that we want to, to prevent. Uh, so we have to have uh, a little bit different toolbox communication. Uh, uh, collective uh, toolbox rather than than uh, than uh, state state by state uh, separately is is what we want to have and, and we want to we want to affect the uh, malign behavior in in advance. Uh, so how do we do that? Every uh, threat activity takes place in different political fields: the economic, the legal, uh, diplomacy. Uh, cyber, all of that, and, and we have to think about uh, the uh, the deterrence toolbox for, for for every single domain. What what uh, what, what is cost efficient for for us and, and very costly for for the adversary? Uh, we picked up good examples from from a number of cases. Uh, uh, we have uh, some interesting. Uh, public uh, publications on our website that you might uh, want to read and the audience would like to uh, have a look at uh, where, we, where we showcase uh, some some uh, cases of, of, of veterans. Uh, from my own country, I want to pick up one example uh, when we talked about the, the Russian uh, social media uh, influencing. Um, the Finland established Finland has a, a uh, had at some point a growing Russian minority, mm -hmm. but now I think it's it's, it's more, more stable. Uh, Finland established uh, uh, traditional media channels, or, or let's say so, Russian news, radio, TV, uh, several times a day. Uh, in a way, the Russian interpretation of, of Finnish news is flow. Uh, so it so. Making, making sure that the Russian minority gets the information that they need in their daily lives from the Finnish uh, quality media exactly. sources. Uh, to de deter that, 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 that minority in our country uh, will not be used against 
against the government, against the main population. So different uh, preemptive <laughs> measures uh, targeted in, yes. in, 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 in various policy realms. So re really they need to be targeted. And uh, well, uh, we mentioned already, already some sanctions in, in cyber, in, in uh, some policy fields, sanctioning is, is, might be a solution. And of course, it can, can be done collectively together with a group of countries, EU, NATO, uh, and it's more efficient. You know, the language issue, I think, is so important because there's some movement um, in former Soviet states to try to ban content in a language. So Ukraine, for example, have, has regulation against Russian media. And in Georgia, they there was a, a push to do more what the Finns did, which was there is there are minority communities in Georgia that get most of their news from Russian language, not necessarily out of an ideological pull, but because it's a language they understand, or a Turkish language, which is similar to as uh, the Azeri community uh, can understand. But there was this reluctance to put out content, Georgian content, in those languages. And, and, and it seems to me that, that they're, you're pushing them towards a, or towards a different source. Um, but also your point about raising costs, I mean, there, you know, obviously you can have regulations and laws, uh, you know, to tighten, for example, the flows of money and, and make it costly or illegal for people to do that. Are there other ways we can raise costs, like the deterrent effect of costs in the information sphere? Well, I think not necessarily just focusing on actually state back actors. Uh, so I talk about the other group of actors who are prominent in spreading disinformation, false content. Those who are financially motivated, I think those are the yeah. easier uh, group of actors to actually target. Advertisers. Because if your motivation is to make money yeah, off yeah, clicks yeah. and advertising, and you know, some are using sort of Bitcoin donations and all the various mechanisms that they monetize, often completely false or partisan content. If you make it harder to make money, think do something else. So in some ways, the state back actors are, are harder to go after in that sense because their main motivation is, is not to make money off ads. Right. But if you take the sort of prototype of the Macedonian teenager building these sort of fake news farms, you have to look at the advertisers and the flow of money into those sites. And that also goes to the platforms and how they are rewarding sort of clickbait content. But if you can cut off these flows of money, that's a way of sort of shrinking the population of problematic content without taking it down. Because again, that always comes with risks of driving people even kind of further mm -hmm. into a, a whole, whole of really problematic stuff. And so, you know, you just start from move. You, you can't moderate yourself out of the problem that we're in in the information space. And doing so, I, I think oftentimes just sort of reaffirms to people that there is this sort of big brother censorship. And you then see people jump from Facebook to a uh, parlor <laughs> and to some of these less policed but that, that, that sort of openly recruit the kind of content that gets banned other places. So I think going after money, successful. exactly. So yeah. going after the financial flows uh, to the actors who are producing content to make money is a way of well, raising costs by lowering the financial incentives for those kind of actors. <laughs> Uh, well, I am afraid that there's so many good questions here, but I'm afraid that we are out of time. Um, I just really want to thank you both for this interesting conversation, and I welcome you to Washington, and I am, am so glad that you took the time to come and visit us, and we really admire the work of the Center and things we are doing. So, thank you, and thank you, Brett. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and, and thanks for your participation.